Hi, my name is Dr. Cheryl Chapman, and uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for our webinar. I'm so excited about tonight's webinar because we have two really true experts in this field. Tonight, we have joining us Dr. Edward Chow and Dr. Teddy Chow. They will be discussing OrthoTool in detail. And OrthoTool is one of the leading software design lenses on the market with good reason. Dr. Eddie Chow was the first Chinese optometrist to establish an optometry practice in Toronto, Canada in 1973. He has his 50th year um, celebration from graduation from optometry school next year. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Chow. As a myopia control researcher and educator, Dr. Chow was the developer of OrthoTool. And Dr. Teddy Chow received his Doctor of Optometry degree at the Indiana University School of Optometry. He's been actively engaged in clinical research, training in areas such as retinal imaging in myopia progression and specialty contact lens design. Dr. Chow has won multiple awards, including the GPLI Contact Lens Clinical Excellence Award and the VSP Primary Care Excellence Award. Dr. Chow currently is practicing at the Chow Eye Institute in Toronto, Canada. <clears throat> and uh, I'm gonna have Dr. Chow share his screen and go ahead and uh, let's get started with this presentation. I know everybody's very excited. Hello, uh, this is Eddie Chow, uh, old man here. And the uh, handsome and young guy next to me is my son, Teddy Chow. So I want to share my experience in the past 50 years in uh, uh, myopia control, also K and uh, Auto tool been around for more than uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, based on long-term experience, uh, I want to let the young people know exactly what's going on with uh, auto keratology and myopia control. Uh, this lecture is based on the understanding of the principle and theory behind the construction of the auto tool. It's a custom designed software uh, with US, Canada, and Chinese pattern. If you are involving corneal and biomechanic and rigidity, it is a most important software to achieve good results because you do uh, whatever you want to create a good lens. Now, this uh, lecture will focus on the hydrodynamic principle and sex philosophy leading to the corneal clearance concept. So uh, later on, you will know uh, from Teddy Chow that what exactly is the sex philosophy and hydrodynamic principle uh, using auto, uh, auto two, uh, what is control clearance? So Ted, your turn now. Thanks, Ted. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin with just stating some of the challenges that I think we've all faced with ortho K designs, and that's the incredible variation individually that we see, whether that's the fitting, uh, the treatment effect, or the regression. So. And that's not just between individuals, even within a patient and between the eyes, you see that variation. And so this is a theme that I'm going to come back to over and over again throughout our webinar, because for me, the custom design platform gave a really great advantage with all this variation. I remember John Mountford in his text said, ortho K is very complex. And when you have simple solutions to complex problems, it results in errors. I don't necessarily feel that contact, like ortho K lenses are complex. Rather, I feel that the cornea, its anatomy is very complex. The, refract, the range of refractive errors that we're dealing with, uh, the range in topographies that we're dealing with, the corneal shapes. And more recently, there's a lot of interest in corneal biomechanics, which makes sense. Um, and I might go into that later. So there's this need to have this custom platform to design bespoke lenses that respect that corneal complexity. And I hope that this webinar will help convey that, you know, despite all the options available today, and there, there's certainly a lot, especially, you know, more recently, we have a lot of interest in small optic zone sizes. So with all these ortho K lens designs, I want to convey that they all have to share the same basic construction. They follow the same rules. And when we understand these foundations and rules, Actually, it's not that complicated. And the custom design then, when initially looks quite complex, you have so much you can change, it becomes a little bit more simple. Okay, so we'll start with a standard, standard geometry design. And you can see contact lens 101, you have a very nice, even 
tier layer here. It's an aligned fit that is the base curve is supposed to fit the contour of the cornea as, as closely as possible. And you'll see a very nice faint, if that even that, uh, fluorescein pattern uh, throughout the most of the lens. This is only seen in the alignment zone of a ortho K lens. So this is the sodium fluorescein diagram that we all know and love about ortho K lenses. And that alignment is in this alignment zone right here. Whereas the other, this annular tear reservoir is what creates that molding effect. And so instead of having a base curve that's uh, steeper than the peripheral curves, the reverse geometry lens, really well named because the base curve is significantly flatter. And so you have this flat base curve that creates this peak TLT, tear layer thickness. And then you have the really steep reverse zone here that kind of completes that reservoir there. And then this is the landing zone. So we're gonna go through each of these zones. Um, and I'm gonna, this is very, very, it may be kind of basic for, for some, but I'm gonna go through each zone, how, why we use it and how it affects the, the fit of the lens. <clears throat> so the base curve first, um, now the base curve radius, so the actual radius of curvature is dependent on the target. So we start off with the patient's flat K. And if the patient's spectacle Rx is minus 250, then you necessarily have to make that base curve 250 flatter than flat K. And then you have an, uh, a Jessen factor. And this Jessen factor is your overcorrection to prevent daytime uh, to account for daytime regression and rebound of that corneal mold. And so right here, we have a Jessen factor of minus 150. And so total, you have a four diopter target that therefore the base curve has to be four diopters flatter than flat K. So for our patient here, that's 38 diopters or 8.88 millimeters. Pretty straightforward. Now the problem comes when the Jessen factor um, it's important to note that I think uh, I, earliest was 2008 with Pauline Cho and John Mountford and, and, and Chan over at Polytech. And they were able to, they, they were trying to validate the traditional 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopter Jessen factor. And they didn't get really consistent results. In fact, they found that it underestimated the necessary overcorrection. Um, so the intended Jessen overcorrection and the post-ortho K wear manifest refraction um, was not one-to-one. -one. It wasn't a one-to-one -one ratio. Indeed, there's been a lot more interest in looking into this. There's been a lot of variation where they found high myopes might require a higher Jessen factor. Um, they're wondering, the hypothesis right now is whether corneal biomechanics has a role to play, which makes sense as biomechanics relates to the cornea's ability to absorb and then dissipate forces that are applied onto it. And so a patient with very high hysteresis or, or, or a viscoelastic properties may require a higher Jessen factor. This has not yet been validated. It's, we're, we're still, it's still quite an unknown. Suffice it to say there is that variation and having that custom design, being able to change and having the practitioner know that it's not simply one-to-one, -one, I feel is quite important. important. So going quickly to asphericity, base curve aspherics basically means that the radius of curvature of an aspheric base curve gets flatter and flatter when you move from the apex to the periphery, the edge of the base curve. So let's say if you have it, and the degree, the rate that it flattens is dependent on the actual eccentric value here. So as you go higher and higher eccentricity, this 8.88, uh, radius of curvature will get flatter and flatter and flatter. And therefore that tear layer, this peak here will get higher and higher. And it, essentially that, that mold and that force will get higher and higher. Okay, we'll talk about why we use aspherics in a little bit, but this is showing that, you know, in uh, contrary to the standard geometry lenses, when we use standard geometry, you know that you know, if you want to steepen the, uh, if you want to uh, uh, change the fit of the lens, we use the base curve, we steepen the base curve, we flatten the base curve. Base curve changes does not affect the fit of the lens in ortho K lenses. That's because the reverse curve is responsible for maintaining the sagittal relationship between 
the contact lens in the cornea. So as you can see here, the base curve is certainly increasing, whether that is it's getting flatter uh, radius and a spherical Jessen factor, or the aspheric, the eccentricity is going up. The reversed curve will naturally steepen. It'll get steeper and steeper to allow for the correct sagittal fitting uh, relationship between the lens and the eye. Um, and I put a little note here for myself. Basically, the same rules apply a 0.1 millimeter change in your, uh, in, your, in your radius will reflect a half a diopter change in that lacrimal, that tear layer lens. And that's a similar rule. Okay, so the reverse curve. Main purpose is to join that base curve, that very flat base curve with the alignment zone. And so the reverse curve is the steepest, uh, uh, very steep uh, curve of the ortho K lens. Now, being so steep, the reverse zone is actually divided into a reverse curve here, and then a slightly flatter relief curve here. And this relief curve basically allows for a more smooth transition between your very, very steep uh, radius of uh, reverse radius and the flat alignment zone. Okay, so this becomes really uh, important when we uh, design lenses for high myopes. You really need that reverse zone here, a uh, relief zone here to ease that transition. Now, there's some theories right now, and um, maybe Dr. Chow can speak to that, but there's some theories that, you know, uh, the relief curve may also facilitate the tissue redistribution from the mid peripheral cornea into this tear reservoir. Whereas, you know, traditionally you're getting this epithelial redistribution centrally into this tear reservoir. Well, the shape of that relief, it, it also facilitates redistribution from the mid peripheral cornea. That I know of, I don't think there's any validation towards this, but certainly makes sense. Um, and, and this historically has been designed for uh, high myopic uh, patient uh, uh, have more than uh, one purpose. This is uh, uh, in this area, this area, the relief curve area, like a spoon, you know, they control, they contain multiple uh, uh, action of forces, including the small capillary forces and the uh, 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 tension force, suction force, and all concentrate in this area helping to get the tissue and the alignment curve area into the mid peripheral curve, you know? So the, the, revert, the relief curve is uh, very important. They serve dual purpose of uh, creating extra forces. Great, so um, the final thing is, I just wanted to show how the reverse curve actually changes the sagittal height of the lens. So uh, in, in the software, you can directly um, it's showing a 6.54 millimeters. You can go, you know, I think I did 0.4 millimeters steeper. And you can really see that apical uh, clearance going up. The sag, uh, the sag of the lens just gets lifted right up. And you can see that in this animation here. When you go from a, a flatter to a steeper reverse curve, it really has a, you know, it, it, it brings the lens right up. Um, this is given a, a, a constant base curve. And then the opposite is true for... Um, a, uh, by, uh, a flat yeah. that pooling in the um, in the alignment curve. And initially, when I was playing with the software, I kind of just you know tried to play with this so that I can teach myself the kind of the dynamics of contact lens fitting. Um, as a student learning this, it was very very helpful just to use the customs uh, platform to understand um, uh, the lens and cornea dynamics and fitting dynamics. So the alignment curve, uh, Dr. Chow mentioned Tom Ream. Uh, so I, I believe historically, one of the most significant changes to our ortho K lenses, our modern ortho K lenses was Tom Ream adding a wide alignment curve to the then popular three zone lens. And that was aimed to improve centration. Now, um, I believe this was then dream lens and it became the most copied design, I, I believe in modern use. So this was huge um, and it made sense, a wide alignment zone that increases the area of contact between the lens and the mid peripheral cornea uh, certainly makes sense to uh, center the lens, uh, center the lens better. And we're gonna get to this uh, in a little bit with, wide, uh, with narrow uh, base optic zone diameters. 
So the alignment curve is actually very important when you build a house. So you have the good foundation so you can build building on top of it. And uh, the alignment curve uh, serves to embrace the whole cornea uh, for effective penetration, both sides, all alignment curves. And the alignment curve also creating forces uh, uh, the push the, the tissue, the push the force into the mid peripheral area for more effective uh, both sides, you know? So uh, um, the old time saying this, the, the alignment curve should embrace as much area of the cornea as possible. So this is related to, uh, with my past uh, uh, experience, uh, related to the size of the treatment zone, the optical zone diameter, because if you have a, a large optical zone diameter, then the alignment curve will be smaller. And then you cause all kind of disentration, uh, uh, high riding lenses, and sometimes if you fit it too tight, then it's go uh, uh, low riding. So we'll talk about it uh, when we uh, deal with the, the optical zone diameter. And in the same way that the reverse zone uh, changes the sag relationship with the eye, so does the alignment zone given a constant reverse and a base curve. So again, I was playing with this and you can change that, make that flatter, make that steeper. And you can see in the graphic here as well that um, Uh, it appears as though we may have lost um, connection. I see that um, uh, Anna uh, is saying that they only see me now. I think we've lost our connection uh, with Dr. Chow. So let me um, message him and see if I can get them back on. That was really odd. Can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. We lost you just uh, maybe two minutes ago. Um, That's why uh, my brother-in-law just jumped in as like something, something. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. everybody. I don't know what happened. I had a pop-up saying, "Let's." can you update Zoom? I guess <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happened. Let me, uh, well, we, we all love our technology. We're so happy you're back. Uh, are you still able to share your screen? Yeah, here we go. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and let you carry on. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. So the overall, di I was saying that the overall diameter determined by the patient's visible iris diameter uh, includes all those zones that we just talked about. And therefore, when you change the width of one zone, necessarily another zone has to change. And so, for example, Dr. Chow was alluding to 
right now when we change the base curve width from the six millimeter traditional to the five millimeter, you necessarily have to make either the alignment zone bigger, which is what you see here, or the reverse zone gets bigger, which is in the next slide. And so it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, we typically rarely change the reverse curve width. It's mostly taking advantage of being able to increase that wide landing zone, alignment zone, when you have a small base curve, um, which, is, which is really important to understand. So whenever we start changing widths around later, I'll show you in the software, when you start to change widths around, um, you have to compensate. Uh, one other width will have to take up the room, take up the room, or give away the room. So uh, the, the, my experience is uh, I, I've tried so many thousands of uh, patients with large diameter, small diameter, you know. So uh, uh, before uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, 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 the left people were saying, hey, you go 10.0. So in, later on in my practice, I never use 10.0. So the diameter should be at least 90% uh, of the whole uh, uh, XVID uh, as much as possible. And then, uh, but, but some of the Asian uh, uh, cornea is oval shaped, you know, so the, with the XVID is a lot larger than VVID. So then you have to sacrifice the, the uh, total diameter? No. So you, you can go over the uh, uh, the superior limbal area by a little bit, uh, not to sacrificing the, the overall diameter, but the software will help you to uh, de design the uh, uh, fringe, the uh, lenticular fringe area, so that they are not going to infringe on the, the superior limbal area. So go as large as possible with the uh, uh, small XVID patient, a lot of Asian uh, with 10.4 XVID, then uh, how are you going to, to, to uh, cope with it? Then you have to sacrifice the optical zone to a smaller one. So usually uh, my average optical zone diameter is from 5.0 to 5.4, uh, rarely to 5.6 uh, or over. As if you have a large XVID, 12 millimeter, then uh, the overall diameter is 11.6, then you can go 5.6. You know, this is uh, my experience. Okay, so just a little bit about um, the optics of myopia control. We don't want hyperopic defocus that's created from your single vision lenses. Okay, so that's bad. And we want that peripheral myopic uh, shell. Okay, um, and then that's peripherally. So peripheral optics creates this peripheral myopic shell. Uh, in our different lens designs. And then you have our higher order aberrations from the central paraxial rays uh, creating, you know, uh, what, well, you know, in our press biopic aspheric designs that simultaneous image. And in the same way, we create sp positive spherical aberration here um, for our ortho K designs for myopia control. Um, importantly, the smaller the pupil size, um, the less that those optics are then included into the pupillary margin. So what we want to do is be able to either make the treatment zone smaller, uh, make that optic zone size smaller, uh, or uh, make that pupil bigger. Um, perhaps one of the mechanisms of using atropine combination with, uh, with ortho K, having a, a slightly large pupillary margin, having all these optics put in. Now, again, going back to the variation in individuals, not all children might have uh, small pupils. Some children with very, very large pupils, you don't necessarily want to create such a small treatment zone uh, to the point where it will impact visual performance. Um, in adults uh, with large pupils, you're certainly going to want to make that uh, uh, optic size as large as possible. What I'm showing here at the top is when you cut, when you truncate that six millimeter, so this is a six millimeter traditional, when you truncate it to five millimeters, you see how that peak just disappears. And this reduces the force. So you really need to find a way to, in your five millimeter optic zone, push that peak TLT right back up to its originally intended six millimeter height. Um, and this is something where 
aspherix will play a large role. So when we use aspherix, as you can see here, this is a small eccentricity value. So it, the rate of flattening is slower. And then the 1.2, the rate of 1.6, the rate of flattening gets much, much faster. And so by the time you get to a really high eccentricity, this peak gets really high just because the base curve is so flat when it gets to the edge of the base curve. So uh, the effect, I find that, uh, uh, that using a freak back optical zone, uh, they can, to some extent, to get rid of some of the glare. This is the principle by Earl Smith the uh, third. Uh, regarding a spheric, uh, uh, a spheric uh, base curve to eliminate mixed astigmatism. So uh, with some a spheric uh, uh, base curve, the flare and uh, ghost image will disappear to a large extent. So this is something that I'm, I'm glad Dr. Chow brought that up because this is something that's still uh, one of the unknowns. And there's going to be a lot of unknowns with um, ortho K designs. You know, the question of creating an aspheric base curve and how that actually translates onto the cornea is, uh, is a very important question. As we all know, the, the cornea itself is aspheric and we try to sphericalize it. So whether this aspheric um, curve creates any uh, visually translatable function uh, or, or mold on the cornea remains to be seen. Suffice it to say, the aspheric mold does increase the forces, it, it should mimic that that mold but there is still a lot to be uh to be uh questioned about uh base asphericity okay so let's go to the clinic um and let's get and build our empirical ortho tool lens uh this is your regular medmod topographer or any others that you can just measure the visible iris diameter as dr chow mentioned we want to maximize the total diameter of the lens so we go maybe 0 0.2 0 0.3 millimeters uh, smaller in width than the total uh, the visible iris diameter and then when you look at the actual topography measures it, it's very standard you get that you're getting your k measurements your eccentricity measurements and then importantly there's this one extra thing here this is from the medmod i'm not sure if you can appreciate the one three and seven millimeter cords here um, but you take that seven millimeter cord, and I like to use seven millimeter because I'm more confident that the data there is not extrapolated. And we take that seven millimeter cord curvature, and we use that to predict the AC1, the starting alignment curve, radius of curvature. The program itself, so the program itself will do this. So I'm going to, right here, this is your user interface. You can plug in all these parameters and the program by using the eccentricity in the flat K and the eccentricity again, how, how fast that, uh, that flat K flattens from center to periphery, it can predict um, an alignment curve. But I found that the prediction is not as accurate as just going straight to the seven millimeter cord curvature of the topographer. Now, therefore, this is what I'm showing you here. You have this seven millimeter cord uh, curvature you, there's a little bit of a correction factor. I make it a little bit flatter, and then we land at a 8.3 millimeter. And so by changing the eccentricity of the eye, we say it's an eccentricity correction. We correct the eccentricity of the eye. We bring that eccentricity down so it flattens less. That will naturally bring that 8.55. Right now you see an 8.3. So we change the alignment curve, not by directly going here, uh, but by changing the eccentricity of the patient. Okay. And, and you can actually order this lens now. So that, that, is, that is the starting lens that you would order. Um, the, this, I'm, I'm going to go very briefly on this because I want to show that the principles still uh, apply. As we created the empirical spherical, you can do the same process to create the empirical toric. Now there's a lot of uh, different thought of when we start using torx. Uh, the most common I've heard of is a sag differential between the major meridians of 30 microns. Um, some more conservative uh, practitioners start using it at a one diopter or more of sill. They start using a toric design um, and they, they claim heavily underused. So regardless, you use the same parameters, you have the flatty, the steepy, the Ks, and like we took the seven millimeters flat curvature, we take the seven millimeter steep curvature. 
And I want to give a uh, shout out. This this formula here, we're not going to go too much into this. Was uh, was used by um, our our own member uh, uh, from uh, AOMC, Lawrence Wong. So thank you, Lawrence. I've used this formula. This is just a little bit of a correction factor. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. They use the seven millimeter steep curvature. They just minus one diopter, make it a diopter flatter. And so you're still using these values and you're creating another estimate. And I've used this formula with really, really good success. Um, once you have the flat and the steep AC1, you enter it in in the exact same way that we did the steep, uh, the, the, the spherical empirical lens. The only difference is you have to change to advanced and then you have to toggle the toric on. You'll have a flat and a steep uh, tear film. And in the same way that we changed the eccentricity flat, uh, we changed both the flat and the steep eccentricity correction to achieve our targeted uh, expected uh, AC flat and steep AC1. And then this would be the initial lens to order. Okay. So if we want to go trial fitting wise, um, this is your typical trial set, you know, um, that, that you get with a minus three myope. And what you see here is that the, the alignment curve is changed by 0.1 millimeters. Um, and so that changes the sag uh, difference by 10 microns for each successive lens in this set. You take that seven millimeter curvature and you do a little correction um, and, uh, of that minus 50, let's say, and you find the closest matching AC1 radius of curvature in the trial lens set. You put it on eye, you evaluate the pattern, and you can see, depending on the pattern, uh, you flatten it or steepen it. In this case, you steepen it, um, depending on that, the degree uh, of, of how flat it is or how steep it is. Um, now, this for me was the most challenging part is just with experience grading this sodium fluorescein. And, and even that is quite limited because we're, we're, you know, we can only perceive, you know, 20 microns and then, and then there's probably a plateau that I can perceive. So my ability to really perceive, uh, to judge, um, you know, oh, how much flatter, I'm not sure how accurate it is. Right. So yeah. uh, the, I, I like to use the trial lenses because uh, uh, my time this the uh, 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 empirical way. Then I asked Dr. Rim to hey, give me a trial set, you know, because I can never find the the proper uh, uh, alignment curve. The alignment curve I told you earlier is very the most important uh, the first step uh, to to uh, create a lens, you know, especially if you're dealing with a lot of uh, Asian kids with tight lit, you know, uh, uh, small fissure, then. Uh, a trial, trial lens is the uh, utmost important for uh, effective results and saving you a lot of chair time and uh, 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 chair time and time, you know, to for designing, for changing the lenses. And but a lot of people, they, they want to do it empirically and uh, uh, the result may not be as good, especially with uh, Asian eyes. Okay. Oh, and you know, because it's a custom designed software, we go by 0.1 here uh, increments, but you can certainly you know, design your own choice if you wanna go a quarter uh, or 0.05 millimeter changes, and that's certainly okay. Um, so this is trial fitting the diameter of the lens. When you place the lens on eye, if you're starting with a 10.8, Dr. Chow alluded to this a little bit earlier, saying that you wanna go as large as possible. Um, for me, uh, if Dr. Chow was talking about an oval cornea, and you can see here that it's certainly the horizontal BID is, uh, is uh, longer than the vertical. Um, what I like to do with my lens is, although yes, I, I keep the uh, diameter the same, it's quite large. What I do is I change, let me see if I have, I change the right here. That AC2, the edge of the AC2, right before the peripheral curve, I can raise that TLT up a little bit. And when you raise that TLT up a little bit and you raise the TLT of the edge clearance, you're really ensuring that the lens is landing on the mid periphery and you're clearing uh, the limbus. Now, this is, this is uh, something that I heard often from um, when Maria Liu, uh, Dr. Liu talks about her CRT lenses. You, you, if you can lift it up quite a bit and you just clear the limbus, um, having, an over, uh, having a large lens that 
that um, goes over the superior limits um, may be okay. And you can do the same thing here. You can control the TLT right there at the edge, at the junction between the AC2. And you just lift that TLT. You could just input that parameter, lift that TLT up, and it clears the limbus. And that's something that I that I do with uh, some um, lenses that uh, uh, may impinge on the limbus. Okay, so let's go into the software. Um, we're almost uh, in the, the final stretch. The software, putting in the parameters, I have our uh, sample case right here on the bottom right. Pretty straightforward. You have your patient RX here and the lens, the tear film will pop right up, okay? And then, so let's let's get into the first thing we wanna do is we wanna adjust the, um, the, the lens diameter. Right now, the lens diameter is at 10.8 and we wanna change it to 11.4. Now, before I show you the next slide, I wanna remind you that when you're going from 10.8 to 11.4, what's naturally gonna happen is the optic zone now at 5.4 is going to get wider because you have a much larger lens now. So to now the optic zone gets wider, you're going to have to change the alignment curve width to push that uh, optical zone in. So you can see here, we switched from 11.4 to, uh, sorry, to 10.8 to 11.4. And sorry, it's going so fast, it's gonna loop back. But you increase the alignment width up, you make it wider and it's gonna push that optic zone back to the, your desired. I mean, if you want a 5.2 or 5.4, you just change your alignment width uh, accordingly. Um, there's a lot of questions that talk about what's ideal, 5.2, 5.0, 5.4. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, so my, my, according to my research uh, with Pat Caroline, uh, uh, the average, the best uh, uh, optical zoom is on average is 5.2 to 5.4. Mostly used, right? And, and certainly, you know, if uh, I don't, I tend to overthink things. And and I, I, I remember when I was talking to um, Randy Kojima, I was I was very confused. What's the ideal too? And and you know, the the ideal that he gave some really good advice. It doesn't really matter as long as it's a small optic zone, you know, and uh, you can adjust accordingly. But uh, I do like the fact that yeah, uh, 5.0, 5.2, maybe there's an ideal 5.2 to 5.4. Um, but certainly a smaller optic zone. Um, okay, so moving on to the Jessen factor, uh, you can change it under the preferences. There's a little gear bar and you can change it on the preferences or you can directly scroll over to the tier layer diagram and then you can adjust and make it a quarter diopter step flatter or a quarter diopter step steeper and you'll see that change in the just in fact the compression factor here and you'll see that TLT going up and down accordingly and that's and that's pretty straightforward um, and that's for your you know uh, adjustment uh, um, later on okay so once we talk about just in factor we have to talk about truncate that truncated uh, peak TLT after the five millimeter zone and so that trunk TL, truncated TLT after that five millimeter zone needs to be corrected for. And how we do that is increasing the aspheric. So by increasing the aspheric, you see this uh, optical zone here is six millimeters and you see that's a 63 micron peak. Okay, so it's 63 micron peak with a six millimeter design. We're gonna bring that to a five millimeter design by widening the alignment zone. And now it's a 47 micron peak. Now, so theoretically, the forces may have gone a little bit lower with this, with this design. What we then do is we increase the aspheric, and you can just uh, adjust it there. And you'll see that 47 micron peak will go back up to 63 microns. Okay. And that's pretty straightforward. So I'm not gonna go too much into more detail with that. Okay. Now, fine tuning the alignment zone, we already went through this, so I don't have to go through too much detail. So let's just, um, I just wanna remind you that we change the alignment curve fitting using the eccentricity here. So we make the ideal alignment curve, if we wanna flatten it by one step or 0.05 millimeters, you change it using the eccentricity correction. You don't change it here, okay? So 
here you can see, you know, the only benefit now, it's very similar to when you're trial fitting the lens, the sodium fluorescein pattern. Uh, the only additional uh, information now is the post wear topography. And, and so you, when, you, when you see the frowny face or, or the central island that you get with the steep fits or the smiley face that you get, you know, with the, with the flat fits, the high riding flat fits, you can use that information to guide your adjustment of the alignment curve to make it a little bit flatter in the case of a steep or, a, or, or a steeper in the case of the flat. In the same way that you would change uh, during trial fitting using the eccentricity correction. Okay, and the peripheral edge cliff we, we talked about as well. Um, I like to just change it right here in the preferences. You can actually just write in in, in millimeters, so 90 microns here or 60 microns, and you can just adjust it and it'll automatically change the radius of curvature uh, accordingly. Yeah, so the the standard, standard only, well, very occasional, the standard width of the PC is 0.3 millimeter. So why we are making it so small that we require to create a water seal environment for effective lens centration and also provide the action at the center and the mid peripheral of the lenses. The TLT, PC TLT usually around 75% for the TLT uh, at reverse curve. Now this is the, based on long-term Tron era. You know, there's no proof, uh, but I feel more comfortable. If you make it too much TLT, then it's uh, loosen up. Uh, the lens is not gonna grab the eyeball. If you use uh, uh, too little, then they could take in. So, about 75% of the reverse curve TLT will be the optimum. So for flat K, flat corneal K like 41 uh, or below, then you use more than 75% and a steep K with the 44, 45 and above. So you, you the, the TLT at the peripheral curve is uh, less, you know? So, so you can see by the frozen pattern that you need more or less, you know? So this is a basic, uh, 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 basic uh, experience and uh, trial by trial and error. No, no scientific proof. Okay, so uh, finally, we're going to optimize our reverse zone. Um, we need to optimize this reverse zone because after we've designed everything, you might notice that the reverse curve. So there's an ideal. Okay. Um, and we don't want the reverse curve to go any steeper than six millimeters. I believe uh, that is a, a challenge for the lathe. Um, and if it's over 6.6, .6, uh, flatter than 6.6 .6 millimeters, it becomes too flat. The relief curve is ideally one to one and a half millimeters flatter than the reverse to provide for that nice transition into the alignment. So if it's not, if it's significantly less, so you can see here 675 and 7.5, if it doesn't reach that, it's, it's not really creating a, a transition. It's basically the, the flat and the steep is, uh, the, the steep uh, reverse curve is, uh, is, is not, it's still the same in the relief zone. So this is uh, uh, depending also on the rigidity of the, the eyeball, you know, so, so it's no strict rule, but you have to examine the, the post uh, uh, treatment topographer so to, to find out that whether your cornea is softer or uh, more rigid, uh, so you can adjust accordingly. Right. So the first thing to that we have to say um, to change the make the reverse curve a little bit steeper. What I like to do is actually just make that width smaller. So when you're making the reverse zone width smaller, you're essentially giving it less room to connect the really flat uh, base curve here back down to the alignment zone. So it necessarily has to get steeper. So if we're going 5.5 width here, you're if, and you go 0.4, it has to just, you're giving it less room to drop back down to the alignment. Uh, so it has to be steeper. Um, again, in the next slide, it goes fast. So I'm gonna say this first, when you drop down from 0.5 millimeters to 0.4 millimeters, that width, that 0.1 millimeter or, or 0.2 millimeter width, because uh, it, this is half. So that 0.2 millimeter width has to be taken up by something. So we'll give it to the alignment curve. Okay, so the alignment curve will then get wider um, and that will maintain the correct uh, optic zone diameter. So for another thing is uh, for large targeting. So like I have a patient minus 
nine, you know, so the reversal had to be wider to start out with to uh, help to uh, move more tissue from the lumen curve, from the central cornea into the mid peripheral area. You know, when it's too, uh, too narrow, then it um, could have a, a lift off, you know, the, the sac will be uh, 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 not uh, good, you know, so effect no good. So uh, for small uh, targeting minus one, or you can go smaller, you know, so, so they depend on the amount of targeting. Right. Um, and, and then finally, to, uh, to really optimize that reverse and the relief zone after you've adjusted the width, you really can, you can change this reverse TLT here. So this reverse TLT pertains to this junction right between the reverse and the relief zone. So when that junction goes, when that height at that junction goes down, that means the reverse curve will get steeper and the relief curve will get flatter. So this ratio, this, this relationship will go higher, okay? Um, it, it, it conversely, if you go Yeah, from, you can see the triangle here is the relief, you know? Uh, and, yeah, and conversely, if you go higher, you see this 23 microns here, you're basically not changing anything. The, it, it's basically a really flat line here. So um, if you wanna fine tune the relationship between the reverse and the relief, and get that triangle, as Dr. Chow mentioned, um, uh, get that triangle there, you can certainly make that junction TLT between the reverse and the relief go down. So that will, you can play around with that. Okay, I think, and finally, uh, the apical uh, clearance. So, so the, the apical clearance are very, very, very important, but most of the uh, design uh, will omit that. Uh, they never put in, but what I find is that is a prime factor in controlling the squeeze film force under the lens. Force of the lid and TLT under the, and around the lens have the greatest influence on the effect of corneal shape change. So uh, I usually start at five micron and maximum go to 10 microns because when you target more then they have already create a tear film, extra tear film under the lens. So, so you don't go too much or else they will be you know, uh, uh, moving around too much. Right, man. Um, and, and, you know, so what I have here is, is just a, a starting point. You can certainly, um, you can certainly adjust as, as you uh, see fit when you get more comfortable with this. Um, you know, this is, um, uh, this is a, a five to 10 microns for a little uh, under six uh, diopters and over 10, but certainly you can change it. You can certainly change when you see, you know, a flat fitting or central stain, central SPK, you can increase the sag of that lens by five micron steps or conversely, if it's too steep and it's a tight fit, you can certainly drop that down. Um, I just wanted to show you what's happening with the apical TLT. You change it directly here in the preferences. But as I uh, showed previously, what's actually changing is the reverse curve. So as the reverse curve, uh, as, you're, as you're making it steeper, as you're making this apical TLT steeper, notice the reverse curve is actually getting uh, steeper and steeper. So what's changing here to create this relationship to increase the sag height or decrease the sag height of the lens is really just changing the reverse curve with a uh, radius, okay? So the software does this all for you. Um, and, um, uh, you, you know, I, I just play with these values here just to, just, just to say, uh, to have fun, but, uh, but really you wanna keep at the TLT you, you want to keep at the preferences here. And sorry, now that we have this, I want to say one more thing. The alignment to TLT, see it's at zero. So that's touch. That alignment to every single junction you can see here has in a corresponding TLT. I'm not going to go into all of those because um, it's way, it's, it's a lot. And frankly, I don't know the intricacies of what actually changes when I change, let's say, the relief one TLT. Um, suffice it to say that it hasn't really influenced a lot of my fits to change these, uh, these minor, these, uh, these here. Um, but that AC2 TLT, when I was talking about limbal impingement and making that large lens not uh, land on the uh, sorry, make that large lens land on the mid peripheral cornea and not on the limbus is, is right there. And that's where you change it. Okay, right here. So talking about a uh, sag uh, difference is a, a very good tool to uh, adjust the sag uh, 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 is to change the, the spheric back optical zone. 
they're making a, a lot of differences. You know, you change from 1.6 to 1.4, then the, the lens dropped down a little bit uh, with uh, better uh, uh, central bearing. And uh, if you're too steep, you know, uh, uh, touching too much, uh, uh, avoiding uh, central SPK, then you increase the strike, then the lens will move up a little bit. No more? No. Um, so that's our last slide. I do see questions here, um, but um, uh, well, you know, this is some just final thoughts, you know, this, there's so much variation and um, again, I'm going to quote, uh, paraphrase John Mountford. <laughs> I really like it, the way he thinks in his philosophy. He, he, I remember him saying there's no inherently superior ortho K design. Okay. Um, rather, the real differences in performance is from the accuracy of the topography data, uh, uh, the accuracy of the manufa lens manufacturer, and the standard of. Whoopsies. Well, nobody has the same thing. Whoopsies. So nobody should be surprised that the Russians. Yeah, what is it? I'm so sorry. That was uh, a reveal to my YouTube. <laughs> I was just watching a video. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. So what I was saying is that uh, it depends on, you know, the there's no ideally superior, inherently superior lens design. It all depends on the manufacturer, the lens design, uh, the topography data, and the standard of fitting. And my hope is that with custom design platforms, um, and there's a lot of uh, custom design platforms, but with custom design platforms, my hope is that we can understand and start to at least improve that part. Uh, lens manufacturing, lens uh, topography data, uh, we may not be able to control uh, yet, uh, that's technology, but at least with custom designs, we can uh, understand our patient's uh, complex corneal shape and anatomy and their, their needs a little bit better. And, and that's why I really, uh, I really love uh, custom platforms. And, all right, so I think so, I, I'm so, uh, uh, one, thing awesome. is, uh, one thing is, uh, I want to say is uh, there's a lot of thing, a lot of thing back in for 30 years. So, so the, the true workshop uh, lecture cover a lot more than tonight. So it will usually take uh, three, four hours. So the only uh, only uh, place we can go uh, uh, for such a uh, intense workshop is that DVD. You know, the, so Cheryl, uh, Dr. Chapman, you're going to. Yeah, Vision by Design uh, is going to be in Bellevue, Washington this year. It is October. I'm sorry, it's September 28th through October 2nd. Um, and yeah, Ortho Tools is going to be there. They're going to have um, workshops so that you can get into the meat of this a little bit more um, and be really, really comfortable with it. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, and I know we we have some questions rolling in. Um, so let's go ahead and just jump right into that. Um, the first question here is asking about sagittal depth difference. Um, when would you start considering that toric design? I know um, you mentioned, Dr. Chow, um, a lot of people will say 30 microns. Do you agree with that? Do you do something a little bit different? Um, my experience is I actually go earlier than 30 microns. You know, I, I, I a lot of my uh, professors and uh, they, they, they always used to say before I graduated that uh, it's underutilized. And, and when I came into the clinic, I, I started to realize that the, the truth to that. Um, I, I like to go after a diopter of sill to a doctor and a, a 125 at least. That I start using toward, and you know, uh, when, I, when I don't do that, uh, when I only see a diopter sill, sometimes it's, so I have to put a disclaimer, when you have the toric design fitting, um, I don't know how to adjust it very well after an initial lens. I might be able to adjust if it's a very significant pooling, let's say uh, in the vertical meridian. Okay, I can, I can steepen that up a little bit, but it gets a little bit complicated. And so I try to shy away, I, I try to shy away from the toric designs initially. If I see a diopter, I try to shy away, but then it, it starts to decenter and, and then, okay, fine, I'll go to a toric design. And, and suddenly it gets better. So I, I have no idea, um, you know, but, but I, I, I tend to start earlier. So uh, uh, for a toric design, you're talking about toric design. So, so for me, I rarely use toric design because uh, I tried uh, in, in uh, 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 before 2008 and then uh, it, it still doesn't work. So the, the way I look at toric design is that you fit the cornea but not treating the cornea. So things, 
the principle of autokeratology is the spherocolization of the cornea and the tissue, uh, the fluid uh, movement. So you push all this uh, 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 toric uh, tissue into the mid peripheral. So I deal with the two or three doctors and most of the time it doesn't need toric, you know, and then uh, sometimes I just doubt if the lab can really fabricate the lens in the best way, you know. So, so this is only my opinion and uh, I usually talk uh, about how to uh, spherifalize the, the eyeball without using a toric. You know? That's really interesting. Two doctors uh, who are both fitting the same design have um, two very different opinions on that. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so, okay, another question here. Um, you talked a lot about adjusting your eccentricity. Um, how much do you adjust the eccentricity value to account for the difference of the K value? Um, for example, 0.1 millimeter for half to after change or um, kind of talk, maybe talk a little bit more about, about that. Is there like a standard that you follow? So are you saying how much, uh, when I change the eccentricity of the patient to adjust the fit? I think that's what they're asking at that yep. seven millimeter cord. Yep. So, oh, so uh, I don't know if this is, let me share my screen again. I had a little bit of a um, uh, formula here. Is it the formula from Dr. Wong? Um, uh, no, no, that's, uh, that's the formula just as, as a starting point. Um, but, uh, right here, when you are, oopsies, sorry, oh my goodness. You know, and some of these are kind of high level questions. Some of these questions are going to be stuff that you're going to learn with a little bit more in depth class, um, or a little bit more in depth workshop, like at vision by design, um, because there's so, a lot of information here. Right here, um, and this is the uh, this is a very rough, every single time you flatten the, by 0 0.05 millimeters or steepen by 0 0.05, you're decreasing and increasing the apical clearance by five microns. So that's, that's, um, that's the relationship there. So if you can see in the lens designs, I don't know if that was the question, I'm sorry if that's not, uh, but 0 0.1 millimeter uh, difference in those trial lens sets will be a roughly a 10 micron sag dif uh, difference. Is that? I do think that, I, I'm not sure, it's not my question, but I do think that answers the question, the relationship there. Um, here's another question. Um, how does, does, does increasing um, the AC2 um, tear layer thickness affect the fluid seal under the lens um, and or does it loosen the fit? I would I would think that does loosen the fit a little bit. You know, it, it, I would I would suggest it does it does loosen the fit a bit. Um, the fluid seal. I'm not I'm not too sure about this fluid seal. I um I'm I'm not yeah I don't think I can answer that question well. So so I uh, never I always hundred percent hundred percent of the time the AC two always zero. So uh, because you have uh, uh, two micron, three micron, they loosen up a little bit. The, the one way I use to deal with the uh, uh, zero AC to zero micron by adjusting the, the, the fringe thickness, the fringe thickness. That means uh, they create by uh, uh, using specific front optical zone diameter. So uh, the center thickness is standard, you know, uh, with my lecture, I always tell them what is the, the basic uh, uh, center thickness, edge thickness, and um, the, the fringe thickness. So the fringe thickness is uh, controlled by the optical zone diameter, the front optical zone diameter. So, so this is actually very, very uh, um, hard to understand by uh, average optometrist, but based on my past experience with the designing and dealing with the lab, so I make the fringe thickness radius uh, uh, thinner so that the infringing of the, the cornea at the AC2 is very rarely happen. Um, and then the, just to add the one time, the, the times that I see the, um, the um, uh, when the peripheral edge lift is really, really small. So if it goes less than 60 microns, then you'll have that seal. And, and that's actually very, 
it, it seals the lens right up and it, it starts you'll start to see um, some uh, uh, staining on the cornea so when the when the edge lift is not appropriate whereas sometimes I initially used to use a really small edge lift you know, less than 60 microns so with auto tools that uh, is, is hidden you know the the front optical zoom diameter is already set already you know to create a, a better a thinner junction thickness and uh, uh, the edge thickness and the uh, the center thickness is also standard so that to create the best uh, 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 best uh, jun junction thickness and the, the flange uh, the like the ski edge uh -huh. uh, design you know uh, the uh, uh, the the finishing of the lens uh, the edge ah uh, very good okay so here's another question um, why is five to ten microns ideal um, I think they're talking about um, apical clearance. Uh, what would be the disadvantage of more or less? And would you go more or less based on refractive correction? That's an interesting question because some of the software designs out there do um, recommend different center clearance based on the refractive error. Yeah, so I, I use starting from five micron with low refractive error and then uh, keep increasing with the, the uh, larger targeting so uh, if you target a minus eight uh, altogether with Jetson factor, then use the eight micron. And, uh, and uh, if you have anything uh, higher than minus eight, uh, uh, minus 10, then you use 10 micron. Anything more than 10 diopter, there's still 10 micron because the, the high uh, prescription creating the, a lot of flattening of the central cornea. So they create, they give you uh, a certain amount of uh, tear film already there, you know, so you don't need to go uh, 12 micron, 13 micron. I tried it out, it'd be too, too much. Mm. Uh, very good. I want I know we're, um, we're running on an hour here. Um, we can stick around and answer more questions, but I know some people are starting to drop off. Um, before we go and answer any more of these questions, can you guys just tell us if I want to start fitting ortho tool, how do I do it? Where do I go to sign up? Uh, we have a website, app.orthotool.com. Um, I, if if uh, Dr. Chapman can help uh, with the with the list, we can send out that uh, email. Uh, we can send out our website and all the information that you can get there. So you sign up and and get access to our our cloud um, software. It's online. So can I you also uh, provide personal tutoring uh, if you have problem. Ooh. Hey, Dr. Chow, will you type into the uh, oh, chat box? Yeah. Will you type that website, please? Yeah. Uh, and so then, yeah, um, you know, sign up with these guys, visit them at, at Vision by Design. Um, and then anybody who wants to kind of stick around and ask a few more questions, I know we've got some really good ones here. Um, thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, so that is on uh, the chat. If you want to see that, app.orthotool.com. Uh, okay, we've got a question here. Is there a particular ratio that should be maintained between the reverse width and the relief width? Yes, this is very important. So you want to relief more in some cases, you want to relief less in some cases. So I make it uh, very simple that uh, uh, there's a table actually uh, with my uh, uh, workshop. So, so it's between one from 1 1.0 difference, okay? to uh, 1.5. So if, if you have a flat uh, cornea, so this ratio is higher. With a steep cornea, the ratio is less. With the less targeting, you only target minus one, minus two, then the ratio is smaller. If you are targeting an open eight diopter, you know, this ratio is more. Uh, depending on the rigidity, so the ratio can be up and down based on you want a more red zone, you want less red zone, you know, things like that. You want a more, uh, more uh, 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 reducing the sack a little bit, you know, for central bearing, then uh, you open up a little bit more, but the limit is from one to 1.5, you know, rarely you go more than 1.5. And occasionally you have a 46 uh, millimeter flat K a very steep K, then they might be less than one, but you know, usually within this range, one to 1.5. Okay, good. Um, all right, so here's another question. In your experience, what is the max reverse curve tear layer thickness for a 5.5, a 6.0, and a 6.2 back optic zone diameter lens? 
Well, the max that we've uh, that I've seen, you know, um, I, I, I TFM curvature, TFM the, the peak, the TLT, peak. Peak, 150 micron. Mm -hmm. So I deal with minus 10 a lot of time, you know. So 150 micron, it doesn't matter. So Same as for much all as, of those. Huh? Same for all. I don't know how to release uh, uh, properly. So they still work, you know, 150, 160, it's okay. But anything below 65, you know, the force is not enough for myopia control purposes. For, for also okay, you know, it doesn't matter. I used to have a, a, a reverse curve TLT is a, a 90 something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I mean, a, a 40 something, uh, 40 micron, 60 micron, uh, you know, but, uh, but for myopia control, you want to build up a strong bull's eye for uh, peripheral defocus, uh, for aberration, then you know you you want more. The radius of curvature is uh, radius uh, of the TLT is uh, uh, not uh, uh, less than six point six, and never go uh, below six point zero. Before if you go to five point something. The 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 width is so small the lace can get in you know so uh, the result may not be good from manufacturing it's not from the from designing. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, here's a really good one. Uh, what has been the anecdotal limit in flattening centrally? Thirty eight diopters, thirty five diopters. My limit is, well, it, it gets really, really hard when post wear you're getting less than 35 diopters. And I can't say that I've succeeded very well with any fits that have gotten. So if the patient, let's say, starts with um, a 40 diopter and I'm correcting a minus five or a minus six, um, it's, it's, it's doable. It's definitely possible. The lens is going to be huge. It's, it's going to be quite tight. Um, the forces, I increased the adjustment quite a bit. Um, but it's really kind of teeter totter. It's not. It's not very stable. And I think if I were to push beyond that, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't be confident in the fit. So that two weeks ago, sorry, two weeks ago, I have a patient with thirty-eight flat K minus five. You know. So as a matter of fact, with uh, also two, the flat K is easier to deal with. All you have to do is increase the the, the forces, right? So steep K is the difficult. I always have problem with steep K with 46 and above, you know? So, so they always have central SPK and this and that, you know? So if you make it uh, uh, too flat, then they touch it. If it's too steep, then, you know, they go over 6.0 uh, uh, 6 millimeters. So flat K, don't worry about You think also too, I have many, many experience with very flat K, 38 something, you know? So it still works, but uh, steep K, you have to be careful. Uh, it's interesting that you that you say that because I have heard um, from doctors who fit ortho tool um, and, and just in general around the water pool, people talk, and uh, the rumor is that ortho tool is very good for flat corneas. Um, so that's good to know. Uh, okay, so here's a question: the the ratio between AC one and AC two, does it matter? And if I'm trying to go for 6.2 or more back optic zone diameter, what should be a good ratio? One to one, one, to one versus one to 0.8? I don't know that for me, I don't know that there's a really perfect ratio. Um, I, I typically tend to see it uh, to be, uh, uh, it definitely certainly flatter, the AC2 being flatter than the AC1. Um, how much flatter, uh, maybe a diop, uh, 1 1.1 or 1 1.2 millimeters flatter than AC1. Um, you know, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I, uh, there's a, so when I use ortho tool, there's these little things that, uh, uh, like for example, five millimeter, uh, five micron clearance in the apex or 10 microns, what's the difference or four microns even. I know the BE retainer with John Monfort, he, he likes to say, you know, the smaller the central clearance, the greater the force. Um, and the AC1 and AC2, I know my dad taught me, uh, you can actually change the widths of the AC1 and AC2. You know, when I use ortho tool, the way I approach it is, there's actually quite for, for there's actually quite a bit of flexibility. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And 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 
And uh, if the AC2, I don't know that there's an ideal or maybe I haven't found it yet. And if any doctors out there feel that there's, I would love to know <laughs> because I actually don't know if there's an ideal. Yeah. I just see typically it's 1.1 or 1.2. So that also uh, involving the width of the re uh, relief curve, you know? So this is the two, uh, mostly uh, standard is 0.3. In my workshop, I always tell them use 0.3. And then if you want to relieve more, a very high target, but you cannot make the reverse curve wider. So you have to, to make the reverse curve smaller for extra forces. So I use uh, say 0 0.5, uh, uh, from 0 0.6, 0.3, I change to 0 0.5, 0 0.4. So 0 0.3, 0 0.4 is the standard, mostly 0.3. So if you have 0.4 width of the relief curve, then the, 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 the ratio, can be smaller. If you use 0.3 as the reverse curve width, then the ratio, you know, I my standard, if those uh, doctors uh, uh, attend my uh, workshop before, so I always put down the first trial, uh, first fit is uh, uh, 20 micron reverse curved uh, uh, TLT and um, five micron uh, relief curve TLT. And then uh, uh, 0.3 is the width of the relief curve and then whatever uh, uh, targeting power, uh, you change the reverse curve uh, width. You know, so, so there's a combination, there's a, uh, a table, the whole table, so that uh, you know exactly what's going on. So at my uh, 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 GCOM lecture in 2019 in Toronto, so I hand out the booklets, you know, to spell out everything, uh, how to design and things like this, you know. so. Uh, VV, VVD workshop is very important. So I have handout, I have all the formula and tables so that it make it easier for everybody uh, to start to use uh, uh, also too. When you're at those workshops, Dr. Chow, do the attendees get to get online on the software, input data, play around with it? No. No, you have to go to register before you can go online, no, yes. right? Well, it, historically, uh, the the software, if you bring if you bring your laptop, because historically, when I attended when I was young, <laughs> when I was in in school and student still, I, I think they we didn't have the app yet, so it was an Excel, um, the Excel program. So who, whichever doctor. Oh yeah, yeah, you can you can bring your laptop. They work with me. So people can, they huh? can play around with it. Oh or yeah, they can oh, play around with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, cool. They learn more. Uh, we have a few more questions that people just keep rolling in. Uh, so uh, let's, are, are you guys okay on time? Can we answer a few yeah, more cool. questions? Awesome. Okay, so somebody's asking, can you fit a 49 by 48 with ortho tool? Is there a limit you can treat? I think they're talking about K values. 49. 49 is the uh, uh, care of the colon. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> so, so, so care of the I did fit a lot of uh, patients. Like, uh, Bruce William, you know, Bruce William, uh, uh, my friend, my buddy. So he fit uh, you know, reverse geometry lenses on keratoconus patient. I did before. And uh, 49, you know, the, the, the number is just a number. Mm -hmm. As long as you have the proper tier film, uh, you know. So the actually, I was talking at the beginning. So we have something, uh, the, the, uh, it's called control clearance. You have the proper clearance from apex to, 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 to the center, to the edge, you know? So, so you can deal with any uh, 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 curvature from 38 to 49, you know? So starting uh, uh, emerging keratoconus, well, I think, I think, well, a lot of people may not be, uh, agree with me that also keratology, also K will help the, stop the progression of the cone. No, well, that was the, the many years ago. I have never put anything above 48. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's right. Well, we to, uh, I definitely <laughs> want I definitely want a topographer that can um, image the posterior surface of that cornea, yeah. right? Um, okay, so does the E value influence your decision regarding potential myopia reduction? E value of what? I think they're that's talking about like yeah. I mean that that's a really old that's a that's one of the theories of uh, John Mountford, isn't it? That that uh, the 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 amount that you can actually uh, correct uh, depends on the eccentricity of the uh, the cornea. If the if the cornea uh, 
So it's a spiracalizing the cornea. Um, you know what? I would say no, but I have, I, again, this is not something that- uh, what, what are you talking about the value of the cornea? Right, so John Mountford has a, so for everybody who, who does, John Mountford had a, I think it was from John, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's all from textbooks. So um, the, the ability of the lens, the ortho -K lens to spherical-ize is dependent on the asphericity of the cornea. So if the cornea is more aspheric, and uh, then you can basically sphericalize it more. You can you can bring it down. So if you're starting off with a patient that has an E value of 0.1, um, you're you don't have much to work with. Well, I don't think so. I, I don't think... know if that's the correct uh, interpretation. Um, I, so I auto really... tool is the it's a tool, you know. So you can design anything you like, you know. Hyperopia, myopia, presbyopia, you know, you just know the, the know-how, you know? So uh, um, my good friend, uh, uh, Fermenti, uh, European uh, Auto K Society president. Uh, 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 so Dr. Fermenti, uh, he said, well, you know, he, he used to also to and GP uh, uh, designer. So you know, anything, any cornea, you deal with some easier, some more difficult. So, uh, but the way I learned in this past so many years is I don't mind trying anything. Uh, uh, you, I keep changing the lenses and then learn from it, you know? So my time, there's no be, no, person, no people can teach me what's going on, you know? So, so everything in the dark, so we have to try it out. So. Uh, uh, sometime one patient back, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I fit them 10 pair of lenses. Well, you know, then from, from the fitting, from the reaction, from the result, from the topographer, you learn what is the best uh, uh, way to design. So now I consolidate all this information so that the, the young people will benefit from knowing exactly what's going on, you know. Okay, cool. Uh, we, I mean, we still got some more questions here. So uh, this is a good one. With small diameter corneas and large pupils, AC1 starts to get very small. Is there a minimum limit for AC1 uh, when the good fit is not possible? Depending on the age of the kid, you know, so you have a, a, a 40 year old, you know, so uh, uh, the cornea uh, is uh, 11, uh, less than 11, 10 point something, you know? So a large pupil. Oh, so sometimes you have to give up, you know? But the young kids, uh, uh, they don't know what is clear, you know? So they don't drive. So my uh, smallest uh, 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 diameter, I go one, one or a few times in 9.8. Um, uh, uh, I start out with 10 millimeters. AC one, AC width, total AC width. I know, minimum. so the, so then you have to, to deal with the- So what's the, the minimum optical, AC, well, AC width that you think? Depending on the, the- So but what is the minimum that has been successful? Minimum. Is there a minimum limit? So, you know, I, I know that the old designs actually had really small alignment widths. <laughs> so I've used 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so a, a total of one millimeter with success. Um, but you know it's interesting when we talk about this that when I when I read about the old designs having really narrow alignment widths and you know I I wonder how they centered but yeah so for me it's one millimeter. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so here's another really good question. Other than central SPK or central islands, is there a way to know if the central TLT is too high or too low? For example, sometimes this um, this person is getting a little under correction and or a smaller treatment zone than expected, and they don't know whether to flatten the base curve or reduce the reverse zone height. Any thoughts? So uh, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question saying, uh, is there any other way besides the topo post wear topography to determine the central TLT, the central clearance? Uh, so top topography with central islands or central SPK. Um, is there any other way? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, it's really, weird. it's really unfortunate because sometimes I see a very steep fit that is a clear, <laughs> uh, pooling in the central, uh, centrally. 
and it's still getting central SPK. So you can get central SPK with steep fits. And I, 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 I you know, hypothesize because it's, it's the, the tight fit is really pushing the cornea and might be actually, you know, you're getting a fake central island and actually pushing the central cornea up. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, um, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, that's one of the issues that I have with fitting is because when I see uh, the lens on the eye and I, I, I see a little bit of pooling. Um, oh, is, the, is that, should I drop it down a little bit? But then, you know, the ability of my eye to discriminate that pooling is, is really poor. And I, I really, um, you know, I, I do go by yeah, SPK, then I, I raise it up a little bit. Um, it, if there's not enough fit, if there's not enough uh, targeting, I maybe have to increase the force uh, or and, and decrease the sag a little bit. And then, <laughs> Unfortunately, if I hit SPK, then oops, I went too much. And unfortunately that trial, I haven't found a way to avoid that trial and error as of yet. And I would love to um, uh, be able to more accurately determine. Yeah, so in, well, yeah, so many things they can change, you know, like uh, the overall diameter, uh, the, the apex uh, TLT, uh, the spheric, you know, the spheric, you know, the, the amount of spheric, uh, uh, from 1.2 to 1.4 or 1.2 to 1.0. So there's a standard. Uh, if you have a, if you, the optical zone diameter is 5.4, then uh, the, the optimum is 1.4. If you have a 5.6 optical zone diameter, the aspheric is 1.2. So uh, uh, the, other way, the other way around, so if you have a 5.2 or 5.0, uh, optical zone diameter, you can go straight up to 1.8 or 2, you know, also depending on corneal rigidity. So you can uh, uh, change the reverse curve TLT. So I say before it's 20 micron to start out with, and you want to skip it up a little bit for both forces, you change to 18 micron, or you can change to 27 micron, you know. So once you have to change to seven mic uh, 27 micron before you have a proper uh, 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 TLT, then you go from 0.5 to 0.6 in reverse curve uh, width. So you can change the uh, relief curve width and relief curve TLT. Then so many things to change to adjust for the central bearing or, 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 or center island, you know, things like that. You know? So so with the actual software, then we'll lead the doctor into say, hey, you know, you, you change the the relief curve uh, from 0.3 to 0.4. And then what happened? So then the TLT had to go less because it widened, you know? So occasionally uh, for high targeting, uh, minus eight, so, uh, including Justin factor, all, all, almost minus 10. So sometimes, you know, uh, if you use too wide the width, then there's no effect. And uh, 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 if you use too narrow, then it's too steep, you know? So you relief. Uh, uh, relief curve width is 0.5 occasionally with very high target over minus 10, you know, total target. Then you use the relief curve 0.5, then then uh, you can uh, 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 survive with the smaller width, you know, for extra forces. Yeah, that's a lot of information. <laughs> We, we need we need all these people to come to uh, visit your booth and visit by design. Okay, one more question here. Besides the myopia control reasons, are there other reasons to use base curve aspherosity, such as presbyopic ads or reducing glare if the treatment zone is smaller than the pupil in an adult patient, et cetera? Um, there theoretically, yes, theoretically. But we still don't know if that aspheric lens back surface will actually transfer onto the cornea. So theoretically, uh, if you have an aspheric back surface and it translates perfectly onto and create a very small treatment zone with, uh, with a very nice sphere, positive spherical aberration from that aspheric, uh, sure. But you get that aspheric positive, you get that positive spherical aberration with a small optic zone and a high Jessen factor anyways. Uh, and by definition, um, that, you know, when you, when you look at uh, the, the topography, uh, the cross section, it's like a V shape, you know, or, I mean, that essentially is a positive, that's, that's aspheric, that is, that is a positive spherical aberration right there. So 
I, you know, I don't, I'm skeptical. <laughs> I, I really simplify it to just use the aspheric to, you know, one question that I've always had is instead of just increasing the asphericity when we truncate that six to five millimeter zone, what if I just increase the Jessen factor? I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, you, you can really match that TLT by increasing the Jessen factor too. So I don't, I just make it simple to use that aspheric so that I know that Jessen factor is, is, is equivalent. Um, but that's an answer that I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious myself and I, I, don't, I don't know. So my experience with aspheric is sometimes they are related to post-treatment uh, prescription. So if I have a patient that a uh, young kid can handle with a plus two, pose uh, wearing a closed lens uh, 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 RX, right? So I say, hey, plus the two, maybe you know, most of the time, young kids, they don't have problem focusing, right? But some kids, uh, uh, they do have accommodative insufficiency. If you reduce the aspheric uh, uh, amount, so the, the, the end uh, uh, result in RX is lower. So I think, well, I cannot explain. So that's why I send my son to, to study, to do more research. So with the change in aspheric, aspheric change also affect the post wear uh, RX. Yeah. What? You, you, Good you, point. Uh, okay, so one more here. I think this might be our last, oh, no, we got more coming in. Okay. How much does the lens movement on the eye influence your decision to change the fitting parameters, for example, to loosen or to tighten? I think they're talking about um, like sodium fluorescein pattern movement on the eye with the slit lamp. So it's smaller, it's a small movement. It will be, but you have to understand, you know, you cannot tell the tear film, but the natural eye tear film composed three microns already. So, so even though there's the totally dark, you know? So there's still three micron under the, the alignment curve area, you know? So so if you have a, so this is the, the proper way to uh, uh, determine, this is how I teach my, my uh, doctor, uh, how to determine the proper fit. It's not using the slit lamp. By using the slit lamp, you have the true, the fourth uh, impression of the, the movement. So I always uh, tell the doctor, please lift the two, the lid up, the upper lid and lower lid uh, away from the eyeball, and uh, with the the, the uh, transilluminating uh, blue light, then use the finger to move the lens and see if they are uh, use the lid to move the lens to make sure they still have a little bit movement. If they're too tight, then they grab on the cornea. Without the lid action, then it's tight. So so uh, uh, if you move the, the lens a little bit with the lower lid uh, to, to touch the lens, they still move a little bit, then it's okay. You don't want to move too much or else you'll be too loose. Yeah, you know, and really open eye environment, closed eye environment, they're two different things, right? Yeah. Like so looking at topography too. Well, uh, okay. we, uh, uh, use the slit lamp to determine how the fit is, then always the wrong because uh, they keep blinking and the lens is always loose. So you always wait until the tear gone away and then you lift, get away all the lit action and then move the lens around and see if they're tight or not tight, you know? Um, one more question here. What is, what is difficult for this person is to figure out which parameters the software determines confidently and which ones need to be changed. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it determines confidently the overall, uh, the everything together, I would say. Like, I don't necessarily know, uh, let, let's go through each curve, you know, the base curve and the Jessen factor. That's actually pretty straightforward. You can look at, uh, if you determine a, a Jessen factor, one, 125, and you have the 5K, it just calculates it for you. You can actually go into the, and, and just do your own calculation. And you'll see that, that that curvature is correct and you can flatten it and uh, steepen it uh, and, and that'll reflect in the base curve. So that's pretty simple. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, and then it, it, based on the curvature and based on, sorry, based on the flat K readings and based on the eccentricity that you're inputting, the software will then determine what the appropriate 
cur peripheral curve should be to create that ideal tier layer profile that you want. And so that's when Dr. Chow was saying you, you change the TLT from the preferences. So then when you change those preferences, how confidently does it output a curve, curve that actually matches that TLT? I have no, I don't, I don't trust that at all. I, like, I mean, I trust it, but you know, I, I, I don't see, there's so many factors where you have to depend on the accuracy of the lathe. Uh, and then how well can it actually manufacture if you change it by two microns, how well can it actually replicate onto the lens? I, I don't think I can. So that's why I really take a lot of these curves. Uh, and that's, I think the biggest hurdle I had to jump over when doing custom lens designs. You have all these curvatures and you have, and, and, and really you want to know, I, I want to know exactly how changing the reverse curve or the relief curve, or is this confident, is the computer confident here or should I adjust it a little bit? Um, I really wish that I could get an exact answer, but um, I've gotten to feel that there's a lot of fudge room, okay? As long as I keep my reverse curves uh, within that, between that six, to 6.5 millimeter. And as long as I keep that relief curve to be one to one and a half millimeters flatter, as long as the AC1 naturally is has a good starting point and then you're adjusting based on what you're seeing, looking at the, not just the floor scene, but as we were talking about with the movement, you can actually push the lens and you can feel that it's tight, it's dragging the cornea a bit or that it's quite loose. But even then, there's a lot of these intricacies because I see a very steep fitting lens and clearly it's drag it, it's, it, it looks that it's loose. Perhaps it needs a, a, a toric design. So um, I'm sorry that I can't say I know uh, how, what's confident. I am confident in the rough measures. So what I'm, That's what I'm confident in. So what I'm trying to say now is uh, uh, sometimes, you know, you think they may not work, but they work. And then there's a lot of mystery behind it. And though you don't know. So I used to de, uh, use a four curve design, the auto tool from the very beginning, uh, 2000, uh, year 2000, only a four curve. But they work. I have a patient with minus nine with a four curve. They're perfect. But sometimes it's minus one, minus uh, 150, it doesn't work. So why, you know? So most of the time, so I figured out in the past 30 years, so there's a format that you follow. So 75% of the time it's going to work. So most of the doctor, the uh, uh, new doctor only target below five doctor, that's easy, you know? So five doctor is easy. Minus one is difficult. So that's why, you know, uh, the, the workshop will, will with the, the, the table I provide for uh, all the doctor, you just follow and they, they work automatically. And then you need fine tuning. So the workshop is to tell you how to fine tune the lenses to become more effective, you know? Well, I think our take home message tonight is that this is an amazing lens that has a lot of intricacies and it's more than what we can learn in an hour, right? Uh, yeah. so, so, so many engaged attendees tonight, lots of good questions, lots of good information from you two with a wonderful presentation. Uh, I would encourage everyone to come to Vision by Design, uh, sign up for the ortho tool workshops um, and spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Dr. Chow and Dr. Chow and, and learn it a little bit more. Uh, and Dr. Theodore Chow, you're having a new baby soon. Will you be at, will you be at Vision by Design? Yeah, we'll see. bring the baby. <laughs> bring the baby. It'll be the most popular thing there. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you everybody who stayed on um, for this long presentation. We appreciate you. Bye. Have a good night.